Episode 492 One Last Chance Pete and Jackson had both told their sides of the story, and now it was Millie's turn. Because of all the negative press leading up to this, what she said at this press conference could have significant ramifications for Pete's career. Millie knew that she couldn't offend Jackson or retaliate against Kaleidoscope. After thinking long and hard about it, Millie concluded that her best option was to craft a watered-down story that would be a compromise of sorts. As he waited for three o'clock to arrive, Peter sat nervously with Noelle. As he fidgeted nervously, she reached over and placed her hand on his to calm him down. It'll be over before you know it, she said, glancing at her watch. Don't worry, there's no way she would lie now. That would be career suicide for her. Pete looked out the window, and then back to Noelle. Do you trust her? he asked. Noelle thought carefully about how to respond. Deep down, there's no way she would trust Millie. But she certainly wasn't afraid of her. And Noelle had her own ideas about how to protect Peter. She would be prepared no matter what. Don't worry, I'll deal with Millie, she said. While Noelle reviewed her notes for what felt like the hundredth time, Pete nodded and nervously gnawed on his fingernails. Just before three o'clock, the reporters started arriving in droves and soon began speculating about what they would hear. I can't wait to see what Millie has to say, one said. Finally, the final piece of this puzzle will be in place. Poor thing. I can't wait to hear her side of the story, another commented. Pete's a private person. This is all very mysterious, a third person responded. It'll certainly be interesting to see how Kaleidoscope handles this. As the buzz in the room grew, Millie appeared on stage with dark circles under her eyes. It was clear that the weight of this scandal was starting to take a toll on her. And although she was wearing a business suit, she looked disheveled. Her manager accompanied her to the podium, and the clicks and flashes of cameras quickly replaced the sounds of conversation. Let's get started, her manager encouraged. They had already prepared a speech, so all Millie had to do was read it. Millie approached the microphone and cleared her throat. She looked out at the crowd and then back at her manager who gestured to the podium. I can do this, Millie thought. As she tapped her papers against the podium, she noticed how silent the room had become. I know you have all been interested in this situation involving Pete and me, she started. I never expected this situation to get this out of control. So I'm standing here today to clear Pete's name. Millie's manager and Noel both let out a sigh of relief. However, this feeling lasted just a moment. Millie stopped reading from her prepared statement and looked up. I'm not in a relationship with Pete, Millie continued. I have never cheated on my fiancé, and nothing ever happened between Pete and me. This has all just been a big misunderstanding. As conversations erupted around the room, Millie's manager and Noel looked at her in disbelief. But we have photos of the two of you together, a reporter blurted out. We've been working together for a long time, so naturally, we would have photos together, Millie responded. 
But that doesn't mean we're in a relationship. But what about Kaleidoscope's statement? Another shouted out. They said that you two were in a relationship. They misunderstood, Millie replied. Pete was interested in me, but it was always one-sided. He's a nice guy, but I'm sorry. I already have a fiancé. He should be more careful about what he says. One-sided feelings? He should be more careful about what he says? Noel and Millie's manager couldn't believe what they're hearing. So you're saying that Kaleidoscope statement was all a lie? A reporter asked. I know this is not what Kaleidoscope would like me to say, Millie announced. But they can't force me to take the fall. This pressure is really taking a toll on me. How dare she, Millie's manager thought. As she furiously stepped toward the podium, Noelle placed a hand on her shoulder. I'll handle it, she said. Seeing the intensity in Noelle's eyes, Millie's manager stepped back. Noelle approached the podium, and a stagehand quickly handed her a microphone. She's lying, she announced to the crowd. Aren't you Pete's manager? A reporter noted. Of course you'd be on his side. The real truth is, while Millie was dating Pete, she was still in a relationship with another man. Noelle responded. But Pete didn't know about it. To say the relationship was one-sided is a flat-out lie. I've seen cheap tricks before, but this is pretty low. How can we trust what you're saying? A reporter asked Noelle. Noelle took a deep breath. Because I care about Pete, she responded. She looked at Millie and continued. I know the details of every single one of your dates. Do you want me to reveal them now? Hearing the emotion in her voice, the reporters became silent, and a hush again fell over the room. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not in a relationship. Pete has no feelings for me, but I'm okay with that, she explained. We're just colleagues, and that's perfectly fine. Still standing at the podium, Millie slammed down her papers and glared at Noelle. You're a nobody, Millie said, her face turning red. Why would he want to be with you? Noelle lowered the microphone and stared back at Millie. She was enraged at her audacity. Actually, Noelle responded, everybody is somebody. Shame on you for thinking you're better than everyone else. Pete is a good person. If you weren't so shallow, you would respect that. Despite the lowered microphone, the reporters were still able to make out what Noelle was saying, and they began frantically scratching on their notepads. They couldn't believe the drama that was unfolding right before their eyes. Seeing how little character you have, I'm more determined than ever to protect Pete's reputation, Noelle said. She then turned to the audience and said into the microphone, After this press conference, I'll be happy to give you the details. Millie's face turned pale as she put down the papers in her hands. I'll give you one last chance, Noelle said to Millie. Will you tell everyone the truth? Episode 493 Millie's plan is foiled. Sitting quietly at the back of the room, Emma was surprised and pleased. She hadn't expected Noelle to stand up for Pete so boldly. 
Wow, that took guts, Emma thought, smiling. Good for her. Millie couldn't come up with anything to say. She turned back and looked at the crowd blankly. Speak, a reporter shouted. Come on, say something. Another reporter chimed in. The reporters were growing restless, but Millie remained silent. Just then, a man with a deep voice shouted from the left side of the room. I believe her. It was Millie's fiancé, Jackson. While two security guards sprang into action to contain the situation, Millie jumped off the stage and ran to Jackson. Let him go, she exclaimed. She threw her arms around him and exclaimed, I didn't cheat on you. I promise. I was never in a relationship with Pete. I know, Jackson said, rubbing her back. With his arms still around Millie, Jackson turned to the reporters and announced, you can't use my fiancé to clean up Pete's reputation. You deserve the truth. I believe everything she's saying. And I bet you don't know why Kaleidoscope is trying so hard to protect Pete. When everyone looked at him curiously, he explained, It's because his real name is Peter Miller. He's Emma Miller's brother and the brother-in-law of Eric Roberts. Emma's trying to blame my fiancé for her brother's irresponsible actions. The reporters were surprised and confused. This was certainly news to them. I had no idea, one of them said. No wonder Kaleidoscope was trying to protect Pete. Well, that was unexpected. Another added, as he read through the notes on his notepad. Let me get this straight. Pete is Emma Miller's brother? A third commented. I never saw that coming. On stage, Noelle watched Millie and Jackson cling to each other, and her blood began to boil. There's no way that Millie and Jackson are going to get away with this she thought. Pete needs to come out with a statement. He needs to fight fire with fire. A reporter echoed her thought. We need to hear from Pete himself, he said. What could he say that would make a difference? Jackson asked. My fiance and I have already made things clear. The truth is that Pete harassed her and then lied about having had a relationship with her. Harassed? Some of the reporters wondered. Jackson and Millie started to leave, but just as they reached the doorway at the back of the room, they were forced back in. Emma was going to speak up on her brother's behalf. Dressed in blue jeans, flats, and a baggy jacket, she didn't look like a celebrity but she certainly had the presence of one. Her attendance at this press conference was even more surprising because she had recently announced she was stepping away from the limelight. Oh my gosh, it's Emma Miller, a reporter shouted. Has she been here the whole time? Now that you've dragged me into this, I have something to say. Emma announced, looking at Jackson. Emma turned to the reporters and continued. Wouldn't it be a shame if you couldn't hear my side of the story? Once everyone had quieted down, she said to Jackson, It's true that Pete is my younger brother. I'm not sure why you think that is relevant to this situation. It's relevant because he harassed my fiancé, and now Kaleidoscope is covering it up, Jackson accused. They wouldn't be doing that if he weren't your brother. 
Emma cocked her head slightly as she challenged Jackson, saying, Harassed. There's that word again. Millie never said Pete harassed her. You're the only one saying that, Emma noted. Jackson turned to glare at Millie. Emma asked Jackson, Did you personally witness harassment? After an awkward pause, she continued, If you didn't witness any harassment, why would you jump to such a conclusion? Perhaps jealousy has gotten the better of you. Jackson paused for a moment. You always have just the right thing to say, don't you? He sneered. I'm just speaking the truth, Emma retorted. The fact that you knew Pete was my brother and still tried to drag his name through the mud will prove to have been a foolish decision. She turned to the crowd and said, Yes, I'm here to defend my brother. He made it to the top of the charts, not because he's my brother, but because of his talent. He doesn't deserve this treatment. He's done nothing wrong. Emma, Millie tried to interject, but Emma stopped her. You have no right to speak right now, she said. Millie could see that Emma was getting angry. You've said enough. A feeling of panic rushed over Millie. Noelle was right. This was a big mistake, she reflected. Now, what do I do? Knowing how powerful Emma was, she stepped out of the way as Emma marched confidently toward the stage. Episode 494 Jackson's Past is Revealed Jack, Millie said, desperately clutching at his hand. Let's let this play out, he responded. I'm curious to see how Emma thinks she can get out of this. He settled into an empty seat, and Millie nervously followed suit. Emma walked onto the stage and said to Noelle, I've got this. Noelle hesitated, but then backed up. She knew that Emma had the situation under control. Glaring at the couple at the back of the room, she stepped behind Emma. Emma wrapped her coat around her growing belly and stepped behind the podium. After a brief pause, she adjusted the microphone and announced, Millie, if you refuse to tell the truth, I have no choice but to speak up. I already told the truth, Millie nervously shouted from her seat. Really? Emma said in an icy tone. Okay then, let's talk about what happened 12 years ago. Millie sat up straight. Her heart was racing as she cried out, No! Please don't. Emma calmly continued. One average afternoon, 12 years ago. Okay, Millie exclaimed, standing up. I was in a relationship with Pete. Yes, I, I was in a relationship with Pete. Are you happy now? Millie's face became beet red as Jackson stood up and scowled at her. What's she doing? He wondered. This was not the plan. Happy? Emma scoffed. None of this makes me happy. Either you come up here and explain everything, or I will. It's your choice. Millie's body stiffened. She had never imagined Emma would use the death of Jackson's mother against her. 
she had underestimated Emma's determination. Jackson turned to Millie angrily. Don't go up there, he said. I have no choice, Millie said, pulling herself away from Jackson. She started walking, but then stopped and looked back. Glaring at Jackson, she exclaimed, I had already agreed to marry you. Why did you have to come up with this terrible scheme to hurt Pete? You're the one who forced me into this. The crowd gasped as they processed what she just said. Yes, I tried to destroy Pete's career, but it was all part of this man's plan, she said to the reporters while pointing at Jackson. He wanted to get revenge on Pete and me. I never wanted to hurt Pete. Why did you do it then? Emma asked. And why would you lie to the reporters? That doesn't say much about the strength of your character. Millie looked back and forth between Emma and the reporters. I'll answer for you, Emma said. It's because you were afraid that Jackson would reveal a secret so terrible that it had the potential to destroy you. You caused the death of his mother 12 years ago. The reporters looked back at Millie, hoping to capture her reaction. She squinted as camera flashes lit up the room. That's why you had no choice but to go along with his plan, Emma said. As for what happened 12 years ago, Kaleidoscope's management team will meet with the authorities and tell them everything they have learned. And they'll produce evidence of the illegal activities your supposed fiancé has participated in over the years. She continued. At this point, Jackson pointed angrily at Emma. What is there for me to be afraid of? I haven't done anything wrong, he exclaimed. He crossed his arms as the reporters looked back at him. So you innocently laundered money? Emma asked, raising her eyebrows. Save your explanations for the police. Jackson's arms dropped to his sides. How does she know about that? He wondered. Emma looked at the expression on his face and smiled. You can try to fool other people, but you made a huge mistake trying to attack my brother. If you try to hurt my family... I'll strike back. Emma then turned to the crowd and continued. Thank you for coming today. I know you will report the truth. Emma backed away from the podium and turned to Noelle. It's all yours. Surprised at all they had just heard, the reporters started talking amongst themselves. Whoa, that was unexpected. What a good sister to defend her brother like that. What's the story behind Millie causing the death of her fiancé's mother? Feeling overwhelmed, Emma walked off the stage and left the room. Noelle again stepped up to the podium and watched as reporters mobbed both Millie and Jackson. Just then... Two uniformed police officers appeared and approached them. We have reason to believe that you have information about a death that occurred some time ago. One said, We need you to come back to the station with us to answer some questions. Just as the police officers were leading Millie and Jackson to the door, Peter appeared in the doorway. Millie reached out to him and said, Pete, you're here. Save me, please. 
Peter pulled away and looked at her with hurt in his eyes. How can you expect me to help you after what you've done? He asked. You said you loved me, but now you've betrayed me and dragged my name through the mud. Worst of all, you attacked my character, he continued, glancing at Jackson. But I really do still love you, Millie cried out while grabbing his arm. You have a funny way of showing it, Pete said. He pulled himself away from Millie's grip and pushed past them as Millie and Jackson were led away. Lies, money laundering, and possibly even murder were some of the topics the reporters debated writing about. There was no doubt that this incident would give the entertainment industry something to talk about for quite a while. Episode 495 Jenna may not be as invincible as she thinks. Peter went straight to Eric's office, where Noelle and Emma were already waiting. Standing in the doorway, Peter saw Noelle and suddenly felt awkward as he thought about what had just happened. Seeing him out of the corner of her eye, Emma turned to Noelle. Did you mean it earlier when you said that you're interested in Peter? Noelle's face flushed, and she paused for a moment before replying, I said it to protect Pete. She then looked into her lap, knowing this wasn't true. I see, Emma replied. Pete cleared his throat and entered the room. What Noelle did at the press conference was very brave, don't you think? Emma asked him. Peter looked nervously at the floor, uncertain how to respond to that question. I certainly learned my lesson today, he said, changing the subject. I know I haven't handled all this very well. I'm not very experienced when it comes to matters of the heart. He glanced at Noelle and she looked up at him in surprise. Their eyes met for a brief moment, and then they both looked away. Noelle thought, What do you know? There may be hope for us yet. After a pause, Peter turned to Noelle and said, I'm really sorry. Thank you for everything you did for me. Noelle could feel her cheeks getting warm, so she brushed off his compliment, saying, Emma is the one you should thank. No, your courage meant a lot to me, Peter said, looking at her sincerely. As he turned to leave, Emma smiled. Way to go, Peter, she thought. Emotionally exhausted, Peter went straight home, where he found his grandfather waiting for him. That young lady made quite a sacrifice today, Jeff noted. You should do something nice for her. I know, Pete said as he headed toward the living room. As he sat on the plush sofa, his grandfather's words rang in his head. He sat in silence nervously tapping the side table and after a while he smiled I know what I can do for Noel he thought meanwhile Jenna knocked once and then stormed into the house is Susan going out of town tomorrow she demanded
problem, he noted, changing the subject. Some illegal items were found on their ships. Let me know if you need help, Jeff said, subtly reminding Jenna that her in-laws wouldn't be able to protect her anymore. Jenna nervously smiled and said, It's fine. Everything will be resolved soon. If their business goes down, it'll serve you right, Jeff thought. Eric knew that Jenna's mother-in-law had been in on the plan to falsify Emma's medical records. He wasn't going to let their family off so easily. Oh, good, Jeff responded. Although your in-laws don't treat you very well, you should still show them some concern at a time like this. Yes, I know, Jenna responded impatiently. As Jeff turned to leave, Jenna flopped onto the sofa, thinking about her plan to sabotage Susan. Later that night, and left. When Eric arrived home a little while later, he found Emma gazing out the window, lost in thought. What's the matter? He asked, kissing the top of her head. Are you worried about something? Emma shook her head and smiled. Honey, with you around, I'm never worried. As Eric placed his arms around her, she sank into his embrace. Then what's wrong? He asked, brushing her hair away from her face. I was thinking about Jenna's baby. Jenna's a terrible person. What's going to happen to that poor baby? Look at it another way, Eric said. The minute that baby is born, it will be free. It will be the best thing that could ever happen to it. Episode 496, The Kidnapping. Susan and her new assistant, Irene arrived at the Swiss airport late in the afternoon. Emma had told them that Eric would send a few people to meet them and that they would be wearing black coats with badges with the kaleidoscope name on them. As soon as Susan walked out of the airport, 
she spotted Eric's people waiting by the curb. One of them looked at her and tipped his hat. Knowing that they were looking out for her while she was so far from home, she felt her nervousness fade. That must be the man who's picking us up, Irene said as she pointed to someone standing across the street. He was holding a sign with Welcome to Switzerland, Miss Susan Miller, written on it in Italian. Go double check and make sure it's him, Susan replied. I don't understand Italian and I don't want to embarrass myself. She actually spoke Italian quite well, having studied several languages in school. But sensing that Irene was up to no good, she played dumb to try and make her let her guard down. Irene walked over to the man and whispered something. She then turned around and waved at Susan and said, We're all set. This is our guy. Susan nodded and walked over while Eric's people trailed behind her, weaving through the crowd to hide their presence. This way, Irene said as she led her to a waiting limousine and then opened the door and got in. Susan smiled at the man with the sign and then looked at Irene before getting in the car and sitting down. The man shut the door behind them and got into the driver's seat. It'll take us about two hours to get there, Irene said. You have plenty of time to nap if you're feeling sleepy. I definitely could use a good nap after that long trip, Susan replied. She glanced in the rearview mirror and spotted Eric's people in a car following them at a distance. She rested her head against the window, closed her eyes, and pretended to nap. Seeing Susan nodding off, Irene asked the driver in Italian, When are you going to make a move? There's a three-way crossing along the way where robberies and kidnappings happen all year round, he said. That's where we'll stop. I have a bottle of wine laced with sedative chilling in the cooler beside you. A glass of that will knock her out cold. Offer her some of it. A surprised look appeared on Irene's face, but she quickly contained her emotions. With trembling hands, she poured Susan a glass of wine and then nudged her awake. Would you like some wine? She asked. It'll help you unwind. Susan slowly opened her eyes and nodded. I would love some. She took the tall glass of wine and closed her lips over its rim pretending to take a big sip and swallowing before returning it to Irene. That's the perfect nightcap, she said. Thanks for suggesting it. She then closed her eyes and pretended to fall into a deep sleep. Irene relaxed as she saw Susan drift off. I'm so sorry for doing this, she thought. But I have to repay Jenna somehow. Susan stayed perfectly still and started to snore softly. Irene watched her for a few minutes to make sure she was completely knocked out and then turned to the driver and said, Please, don't be too rough with her. How we treat her isn't any of your business, he said narrowing his eyes. We'll do whatever we need to get the job done. The car continued to race forward, and Susan didn't show any signs of waking. After an hour of driving, they reached the dangerous three-way crossing, where someone was waiting to meet them. The driver stopped the limousine, tied Susan's wrists and ankles together and wrapped a blindfold over her eyes. He called over the man standing at the crossroads 
and the two of them lifted her out of the car, bringing her over to another vehicle. She's your problem now, the first driver said. Irene watched as the man took Susan away and closed her eyes tightly as she felt her palms begin to grow clammy. They're carrying her off like she's a dead body, she thought. What horrible things are they planning on doing to her? She wanted to tell them to call the whole thing off, but her words stuck inside her throat. She just stood there and watched as the man drove away with Susan. The driver returned to the limousine and said, You can call the police now. She fumbled to grab her phone out of her purse, and her stomach clenched as she dialed the emergency line. I'm calling to report a kidnapping. The kidnappers rushed away with Susan trapped in the back seat. But the large black van full of Eric's people swerved in front and blocked the road. Several muscular bodyguards piled out of the van, yanked the kidnappers out of their car, and restrained them. They helped Susan out of the car, removed the blindfold, and cut the restraints around her wrists and ankles. Then they slashed the car's tires to make sure no one would drive away with it before the police arrived to arrest the kidnappers. Are you okay? One of the bodyguards asked as he placed his hand on Susan's shoulder and handed her a bottle of water. She caught her breath and then gulped down the water, her face glistening with sweat. I'm fine, she said. You guys got here just in time, though. I was starting to get a little panicky, and it was hard to pretend that I was so completely out of it. You're very brave to have played along for so long, he said, taking the empty water bottle from her. That guy was seriously scary. I knew Eric would send someone to save me, she said. Even though I trusted him completely, it was still pretty traumatic, she thought, wiping the sweat from her forehead. If I had moved at all, they might have killed me. Don't worry. Eric has everything under control, the bodyguard said. We'll take you to a nearby inn to get some rest. Susan nodded and smiled. I sure could use a real nap after all that stress. Her eyes glazed over, and she let out a deep sigh. I can't believe that Irene turned against me so easily for one of Jenna's schemes, she thought. How could she be so cold? After arriving at the motel and settling in, Susan called Emma to let her know she was okay. She then called Jeff, who was sitting in his study at home, and explained the entire situation in detail. Jenna is completely off her rocker, he said. I can't believe she would risk your life like that. He flew into a rage and pushed everything off his desk, sending stacks of papers flying everywhere. What's wrong? Peter asked, rushing into the room after hearing the noise. I've never seen him this mad, he thought, as he saw Jeff's face contort into an angry grimace. What's gotten into him? Jeff took a deep breath and calmed down. I'm glad you're okay after all that, he said into the phone. Let's wait and see what she'll try to do next, and we'll go from there. I'll be careful until then, Susan said. Don't worry too much about me. Hearing the conversation, Peter said, Let me guess, Jenna did something terrible again. Jeff put down the phone and clenched his fist. 
How did our family create such a monster? He asked. Where did we go wrong? Peter walked over and hugged him tightly. Susan is right, he said. You shouldn't worry so much. With Emma and Eric around, every time Jenna tries to do something awful, she'll only hurt herself in the end. Let's wait and see what she plans to do to the family business, Jeff said. She's lucky that she's pregnant, or I wouldn't be playing so nice. As soon as she has that baby, the kid gloves are coming off. Irene called the Miller house to report that Susan had been kidnapped. And when the housekeeper took the call, she was so startled that she almost dropped the phone on the floor. The housekeeper rushed over to Jenna, who was sitting in the living room watching TV. What's wrong? Jenna asked, turning the TV off. Susan has been kidnapped. And the police are searching for the kidnappers, she said in a panic. How could this happen? She asked as she heard Jeff's footsteps swiftly approaching. She forced a worried look onto her face. Don't tell my grandfather about this. I don't want him to worry about her. Call the Swiss police and check on the situation, Jenna said. Our corporation is expanding, and we can't do it without Susan. Jeff stood behind her and watched her put on her act. He was tempted to walk up and shake her, but he knew he had to put up with her trickery for a bit longer while their plan was put into motion. The housekeeper looked at him and said, Hello, Mr. Miller. Jenna turned around and gasped. Have you heard the terrible news? What happened to Susan? He asked 